Welcome back to Econ 104, Introduction to Macroeconomics. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at our Keynesian cross model. Now, in our intro to macroeconomics, this is really our fundamental, this is our workhorse model. Well, our introduction to our workhorse model, rather. It's going to be our first model we take a look at to explain our economy, to explain why things work the way that they do, how come things change, how come we have increases in output, drops in output, all of that. And then as we carry forward, we will utilize this model to carry on and build our next model. So that is really this model is fundamental. And the understanding of this model is fundamental in order to be able to work through our next model. So this is for many students abstract. This is for many students a little bit technical, bunch of math going on, bunch of algebra. We'll take it slow, we'll work through it. Keep in mind, you can always pause, rewind, go back and watch it again, right? That's the beauty of this, is that you can watch it as many times as you want in order to get it. I will also be posting a separate video that is just strictly a walkthrough on solving the Keynesian cross and manipulating it and playing around with it. So watch out for that one as well. Okay, if I haven't you know, scared you off by now, let's go jump over into it. We'll start by taking a look at it and, right, really, I've, I've kind of hyped it up. Hopefully you guys look at it and you're like, well, hey, Keith, that wasn't actually that bad. So to take a look at our Keynesian cross, let's, let's actually really start by taking a look at our whole circular flow diagram. We introduced this way back and we took a look at this guy to say, hey, we could follow the way that money flows through an economy. And we use this to kind of separate between our expenditure and our income approach, our expenditure and our income side of measuring GDP. For our Keynesian cross, what we're really going to be focusing on is all of these orange arrows here. That is, with all these orange arrows, we're focusing on our, on our expenditure side. Then we want to take a look at this expenditure side and measure GDP through that approach. Some big assumptions with this model. So, okay, first thing we've talked about, we have this. We're going to say, hey, we're focusing in strictly on this right-hand side of our model, strictly focusing in on our expenditure side of GDP. So, hey, expenditure side of GDP, that is GDP, Y, income, GDP, output. We can say that, hey, GDP is equal to consumption plus investment plus government expenditures and then plus our net exports so okay all of that put together that is our expenditure approach what we're going to be doing is we're going to be making some assumptions about these different variables about well what influences our consumption what influences our investment government expenditure on and on and on and then through that we can expand this and collapse it down to something nice and see how all that works out but before we start poking and prodding at this model itself, let's, let's talk about some assumptions. Some assumptions. So, so there's two, two big assumptions here that we are going to bring up. The first, the first is that this is a demand model. So that is that our economy is demand specific. And in this here, we have an fundamental implicit underlying assumption that hey our businesses our producers all of that they can scale up production they can scale down production more or less at a whim in order to meet whatever is being demanded by everybody in the nation so hey if all of a sudden we have a huge surge in demand not a problem our factories had excess capacity our factories can just ramp up their production and boom, there we go. We're able to satisfy all of this demand that we have. Similarly, hey, all of a sudden, our GDP, our output, our demand for output falls. Well, firms can react to that and they can just scale down production. Attached to this as well is the assumption that, hey, firms can do all this at a fixed price level. That is, this model assumes that prices are fixed, that there is no inflation, that, hey, our price level is constant from one period to the next. And that is, hey, if all of a sudden we have a surge in demand for new output, and that surge in demand, all of a sudden firms need to ramp up their production, 
Well, this model says, hey, yeah, cool, firms can ramp up their production, and that's no change in the cost per unit. That's no change in the costs of production. Yeah, okay, total costs increase because you're producing more stuff, but on a cost per unit basis, there's no change. So, hey, if there's no change in the cost per unit produced, there's no change in the price which you sell that unit for. So, some big assumptions here that we'll work with, but fundamental to this model. As we move forward, well, as we move forward, these assumptions will be relaxed, and that will be as we move on to our next model, which is built up from this one. Okay, so let's go back and take a look at our expenditure approach to measuring GDP. So again, what do we have? We have GDP, output, income, all right, all synonymous terms there. It is equal to our private consumption, plus our gross investment, plus our government expenditure, and then add in our net exports. That is our exports minus our imports. So, okay, that's our approach here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna separate some of these guys, and we're gonna make some assumptions, and that's all they are is just assumptions, right? As you go deeper into this, you can break it up even more, but we're gonna make some very simple ones in this case that some of these variables we're going to say are induced and some of these variables are autonomous. And you might be looking at this and writing it down and being like, I don't understand what you mean by this, Keith. Okay, that's, that's fine, right? So let's talk about that. What do we mean by induced? Well, items which are induced are induced by our current income. Right, so if we have more income, we're going to, well, let's, for example, let's just uh, make induced, just to highlight this, we'll make induced green. If my income goes up, I have more money to spend. Well, hey, let's just jump back and take a look at this here. If I have my income goes up, more money coming into this household, well, then, hey, by default, I'm going to have more money going out in consumption. I'm going to have also more money going into savings as well. And then, of course, if there's more income coming into the household, well, there's going to be more tax revenue being collected too. Right? So what we can see is in this case here, well, okay, we kind of seem to be going in both ways. More income, more consumption, but hey, consumption also explains income. So uh, they go both directions there. So, okay, we're going to have to work that out. We're going to have to figure that out. But in that sense, what we're going to say, we're going to say that consumption is induced. Our amount, the amount that we want to consume in a given period is going to be dependent on the income that we receive, right? And that's the national income, the level of GDP. Carrying on then, our next one there is investment, gross business investment. Right. Keep in mind that's investment in new factories and new equipment, machinery, et cetera, et cetera. Inventories, real estate, all of that is investment. <clears throat> we're we're going to presume, and again, just for this modeling case, we're going to presume that autonomous, or sorry, rather that investment is autonomous. And what autonomous means, okay, induced, induced by our level of income, by our level of GDP. Autonomous, that's just going to mean it's independent. It does not, it is not influenced by what is happening with our level of output. It is not influenced by what's happening with GDP. Our story in this case is that our businesses, they make their business plan, they make their investment plan, they decide, okay, given everything going on, we're going to buy this much machinery, we're going to buy this much capital, we're going to expand our factories. And really, that's based off of future expectations. That's based off of a lot of other factors, but it's not based off of our current level of income. So some assumption that we're making there. Next one, government expenditure. Well, again, we're going to presume that government expenditure is autonomous. So again, autonomous, what we mean by that is that it's independent of income. Our government will set their budget. They will determine everything they're going to be spending their money on. And then, okay, once they figure out everything they're going to spend their money on, they go ahead and they implement it. And they do so irrespective of changes in income. Once they, change, once they set their budget, 
we may have all of a sudden a booming economy and income goes up. Well, that has no influence on government expenditure. Once they set their budget, maybe our output starts to fall a little bit. Well, again, that has no impact on that level of government expenditure. Finally, we have net exports. Let's, uh, let's kind of open this up. Let's say instead of net exports, let's write it as exports minus our imports. Okay. So if we have it this way here, net exports, exports minus imports, well, we're going to presume that our exports are autonomous, again, independent of our level of income. For each of these autonomous things, there are things that influence them, and we will talk about what these determinants are. But for now, all we're doing is we're saying, hey, it's dependent on income. It's not dependent on income. That is, it's dependent on GDP or not dependent on GDP. Autonomous, not dependent on GDP. So again, exports does not have any influence, or sorry, our income does not have any influence on what our exports are. Final one then, <clears throat> our imports. Well, in this case here, just as our consumption is influenced by how much money we have, well, if you want to think about it this way, part of our consumption is going to be on domestic goods, part of our consumption is going to be on foreign goods. So as our consumption is influenced by our level of output, our level of income, our level of GDP, so too are our imports. And as a result, we will say that our imports are induced. So, okay, we've separated out our expenditure approach to GDP into these induced and these autonomous components. Let's go talk about these induced components in particular. Let's take a look at them and let's say really what that means. And we'll do that by starting off with consumption. So starting off with consumption. So we've said, hey, consumption is going to be influenced by our level of GDP. That is really the math way that we could say this is we could say that, hey, consumption is a function of income. That is our consumption is a function of GDP. And that is this C here. This isn't going to be just consumption in our case. This is going to be what we're going to call our consumption function. And again, it's going to be that consumption of, sorry, our function of income. Now, okay, what's going to influence this consumption function? What's going to fit into all this? Well, in order to understand it, let's jump back to our circular flow diagram and let's take a look at our consumption side of things. So, okay, we have our household here. And in our household, we have flowing in all of our sources of income. So all of that, that's our income, that is our GDP, all of that flowing into the household. But then right away, what we have coming off is our taxes. So, okay, we have all of our money coming in and then boom, government takes their taxes. So we lose that right away. Income less taxes. So let's see, do I have room? Uh, so let's just make this guy just a little bit smaller and I can write some stuff down. There we go. And since I did that, and those guys line up, okay. So we do that. We have right away all of our income coming in minus our taxes. Well, income minus taxes, this is our disposable income. Right, and we've already taken a look at this. We took a look at this in our previous case, looking at trade and international flows of capital. And we already said, hey, look, we have all of our income, our GDP, our output, Y. We minus our taxes, and that was our disposable income, our leftover after tax. So this whole term here, Y minus T, we're going to give it a special name. We're going to call it Y superscript D for, hey, disposable income, GDP after tax. Okay. Once we have this after-tax income, this is everything that we get to play with now as individual consumers, as households, we now have options. We can either save some of this money, that is, we can put it in financial markets and get a rate of interest from that savings. That is essentially we're putting some of this money aside today so that we can eat it tomorrow. 
Alternatively, what we can do is we can take this disposable income and we can eat it today. We can buy things today, clothing, all of that, food, shelter, all of our consumption, all of our consumables, all of this present period consumption, and that's what our disposable income is split between. So, okay, what we have so far is we have our income coming in, we wanna get rid of taxes. So we wanna get taxes off of it to be left with our disposable income. After that, we need to split things between our present needs, our present consumption in this period, consumption, and what will be eventually our future consumption or our current savings, right? What we're gonna to save today. So that's our idea of what we're gonna to do to build this consumption function. Let's go back, let's take a look at it and see how this actually works out. So, okay. What we're gonna have is our consumption function. We're gonna say that this consumption function is equal to, so first thing we're gonna have is all of our income coming in. So hey, our consumption function is gonna be equal to all of our income coming in, our GDP. Hey, income equals consumption. Oh, but wait, no, no, we have taxes. We have potentially savings. So let's start off and let's get the whole tax bit going on. There's two ways we can represent this tax bit. We can represent it just like we had back here, Y minus what we'd have is big T. This big T being our total tax revenue. Another way to think about it though is to say that, hey, this big T, total tax revenue, well, hey, taxes, tax revenue, this is coming off of our output, off of our income, off of our GDP. That is, hey, hey, these taxes, these are induced as well. That is, they are dependent on how much output we're creating. If we're creating more stuff, the government gets to collect more as taxes. If we're producing less stuff, if GDP falls, well, so does government tax revenue. So in that case there, we can say, hey, taxes, total tax revenue, they're going to be equivalent to our tax rate, which I'll do as a little t, times y. So hey, how much GDP we have, how much as a percentage between zero and one the government takes of each dollar of output generated, and then that all together will give us our tax rate. So Okay, okay, if, if that's the case, we can do y minus, instead of y minus big T, we can do y minus little t, y. And then we can take a look at that and we can say, oh, hey, hey, we can, we can have y common to both here. We can do a little trick, we can factor that out. So we would have our consumption function now equal to y times one minus our tax rate. That is, hey, if the government were to take T percent from us, from our income, they're gonna leave for us one minus T. One minus T is that leftover that we get to keep. So, right, to put some numbers to that, if the government's gonna take 10% of my income, well, they're leaving me 90% of my income. They're taking 0.1, they're leaving 0.9. So, Okay, we have this, we have our total GDP, our income, and then how much is taken off after tax. That is this guy all together. We've already said we have a special name for this. That's going to be our disposable income. So Y subscript D, our income after tax. Okay, so we've gotten care of that bit part there. Now we need to separate this disposable income between its two parts. We're gonna have this disposable income and our two options are we can either eat it today or we can save it and eat it tomorrow. So what we're gonna introduce is we're gonna introduce a concept known as the marginal propensity to consume. MPC, the marginal propensity to consume. And what this marginal propensity to consume is, is saying, hey, you earn plus $1 of income. So there we go, plus $1 of income. 
How much do you consume? So, hey, if you want an extra dollar of income, does that entire dollar just go towards cheeseburgers? Or, hey, if you earn that extra dollar of income, and, and to be truthful, I'm being a little bit sloppy here, extra dollar of disposable income. If you earn this extra dollar of disposable income, does that entire dollar go towards cheeseburgers? Or, hey, do you save some of that and maybe only put 80 cents towards cheeseburgers? Right? And of course, this marginal propensity to consume is going to be different for everybody. But what we're going to take a look at is, on average, throughout the entire population, kind of this average marginal propensity to consume. Altogether, this marginal propensity to consume will be bounded between 0 and 1. That is, if we had an extreme case with a marginal propensity to consume of 0, well then, hey, you've earned an extra dollar of disposable income. You're not consuming any of it. You're putting that entire dollar into savings. If we had a marginal propensity to consume of 1, well then, we earn an extra dollar of disposable income, and that entire dollar is being spent on cheeseburgers, being spent on consumption. So, marginal propensity to consume, that's the idea there. Extra dollar of disposable income, how much goes towards consumption. Okay, so what we'd want to do is we'd want to then say our disposable income, we're trying to figure out how much we're consuming altogether. So, okay, how many dollars do I have of disposable income times my marginal propensity to consume, telling me, hey, how many of those dollars I'm going to consume versus save. And that gives me a good starting point for my consumption function. Last thing I want to include with it, I'm just going to go like this. I'm going to go plus and I'm going to go little c. And you're like, oh, it doesn't look like the big, yeah, it does look pretty similar. That's just my chicken scratch. This we would typically denote as a small or a lowercase c. And this small or lowercase c, this would be our autonomous consumption. This would be the part of consumption that, hey, I would have to engage in irrespective of my income, right? And you can kind of think of that. There are things that you have to consume today. There are things that you have to consume in the present period, irrespective of what your income does. <clears throat> Even if you had no money, you would have to borrow, you would have to do something in order to consume so much clothing, food, heat, etc., etc., etc. So that is, there's some baseline autonomous consumption, even if you had no income. So, okay, all together, what does this work out to? I'd like to write this in a bit of a different way. That is, I'd like to write my consumption function as the marginal propensity to consume times my disposable income plus my autonomous consumption. Oh, I did a little fancy C there, right? Plus my autonomous consumption. And you're looking at this and you're like, wow, that's, that's just bunch of garbly goop. What does that even mean? Well, what I want to bring your attention back to <clears throat> is kind of with our math speak, really what this is getting at. And that is if we go back to just thinking about math, and that's what we're doing, right? Consumption function, this is math. Well, typically, the math formula that most of you would be most familiar with is the formula for a line. And that is this whole y equals m x plus b, where, hey, y, this is our vertical x, that is our horizontal axes, m, that is our slope, and b, what's b? b, that is our vertical intercept. So, okay, that's our typical formula for a line. If we were to take a look at, well, really, what does that end up getting at? We, we could visualize that. We would have y and y just as in a variable y, not necessarily as in GDP. x, that's our horizontal. And then if we had a line with, say, a positive slope, 
Well, we would start off at some point, maybe B is zero right there. And a positive slope, we would just be going up like that. M being our rise, rise over our rise. And we just have a formula for a line. There we go. We've just plotted our line, given some imaginary numbers. Okay, if we go back to then this consumption function, this is, this is essentially what we have. MPC, well, this is just some value between 0 and 1. That's, that's just our slope. Disposable income, well, that's our exogenous variable. That's the variable we witness out in the wild. That's our X variable. And we take that and we put it through this function in order to get our endogenous variable, the output, that is our consumption. So, okay, we have that. What's, what's C? Well, this little bit here, C, our autonomous consumption, that is just B, our vertical intercept. That is how much we're going to consume, even if our income were zero. So let's graph a notional consumption function, and let's see what exactly that would look like. Okay, so to graph this consumption function, let's start off with our axes here. We have on the vertical axes, always labeling our axes, we have our consumption function, that is consumption as a function of income. And then on our horizontal axes, we have our disposable income. So disposable income, which keep in mind, disposable income, that is our income times one minus our tax rate. Okay. What we then have is our line starting off at C, our autonomous consumption. So, hey, let's put some point. We would assume autonomous consumption is positive. So I'm going to keep on with this fancy looking C. I kind of thought that was fun. So our fancy looking C there, that is our autonomous consumption, our level of a consumption. Even if our income was zero, we would still need to eat. We would still need to have clothes. That is the amount of stuff we'd have to consume day to day. As our income grows, though, as we get more and more disposable income, well, we talked about this. Marginal propensity to consume is a positive number between zero and one. That is, for every extra dollar of disposable income we receive, we're going to consume some amount of it in a positive sense. Maybe 80 cents, maybe 90 cents. Either way, what happens is that from this point here, we're going to have an upward sloping line representing our consumption function such that, as we said, our slope there, that is our marginal propensity to consume. How much for every extra dollar we spend on consumption versus the alternative being savings. So there we go. We have our idea of our consumption function. Cool. Uh, what exactly do we do with it? What's really the point of it? Well, let's let's work through a brief example here and let's work through how we can figure out hey how much we're consuming and then implicitly with that how much we're saving and then the corresponding tax rates and all of that attached to it so again let's go jump over take a look at a quick example here okay so suppose we have a notional economy and we'd have more information than this for the full situation but we're just interested in our consumption side right now in this economy, we have total GDP, total income, total output to be equivalent to $1,000. We have a marginal propensity to consume of 0.8, that's 80%. So hey, for every extra dollar of disposable income we earn, we spend 80 cents of it. That is, hey, for every dollar I earn of income, 80 cents of that goes towards consumption, 20 cents towards savings, right? So hey, we can just thinking about that, I can add this on here. If marginal propensity to consume is 80 cents on the dollar, well, you could come up with another term. We could call this the marginal propensity to save. And yeah, I've done a really small subscript there, S-A-V-E-M-P, save. That is, hey, for every extra dollar of disposable income, how much am I going to put into my savings? Well, that's just going to be equal to 1 minus my marginal propensity to consume. Right, because hey, if I'm save if I'm consuming 80 cents, that means I'm saving 20 cents. Just 
the logical conclusion from that. Okay, carrying on, what else do we have? We have our tax rate here. So here we have a tax rate of 10% for every extra dollar of income, of every extra dollar of output generated, the government's going to take 10 cents on the dollar. So they're collecting 10 cents on the dollar of all of this income generated. Finally, we have our autonomous consumption. We have our level of consumption that we would have to have even if our income was zero, right? This would be our minimum income that we would have given our preferences, wants, desires, ability to borrow, all of these extra little things out there. So let's, let's build up our consumption function. We know, right, from what we just built up that our consumption function is, sorry, let's go consumption function. So consumption is a function of disposable income is equal to our marginal propensity to consume times our disposable income plus our little fancy C there plus our autonomous consumption. Well, okay, I have marginal propensity to consume. I can throw that in. That's 0 0.8. I um, don't have disposable income though. Hmm. That's, that's problematic. What, what am I going to put there? Well, keep in mind, for disposable income, all that this guy here is, is our income after tax. So, hey, we said that disposable income, that was income times 1 minus our tax rate. Well, hey, we know that. We know what GDP is. We know what income is. We know what our tax rate is. So, so we, we can update. We can update that. We can go, hey, disposable income, that's going to be 1,000 times 1 minus 10%. Okay, so a little square brackets there, that's going to give me my disposable income. And then add on my autonomous consumption, so we'll add on this 300. Okay, putting that together, we're going to have 0 0.80, marginal propensity to consume. My disposable income, well, what's that going to be? 90% of, right, 1 minus 0 0.1, that's going to be 0 0.9 of 1,000. So that's going to give me 900 worth of disposable income plus 300. And I'm keeping this here in its square brackets because, right, this is technically just our variable Y disposable income. In this scenario here, we just know Y disposable income is 900. That is, right, if we, take, if we take a quick break from solving this, if we go take a look at our graph, right, being able to interpret these graphs is a very important skill. We have, so we can just draw it notionally here. We have our level of consumption, autonomous consumption. Hey, we know that is 300. We then have our slope here. That's our marginal propensity to consume, our rise over our run. Well, hey, we know that is 0.8, giving us all together this line, this intercept, this slope as our consumption function altogether. So, hey, there we go. All we need to know was our autonomous consumption for the intercept, our marginal propensity to consume for the slope, and we have the idea of our line. As we go through and solve this, we're saying, hey, hey, but we actually know that our disposable income is 900. That is, we know that GDP is 1,000. Well, okay, if that's the case, if we know that, essentially all we're doing is we're saying, okay, let's suppose something like that. That's our 900 of disposable income. If we take this up to our line here, we get the corresponding, all the way over to our vertical axes, we get our corresponding value of our consumption function. That is our value, how much we're actually consuming out of our disposable income. So let's go through and actually solve that. So to solve that, we're going to do 0.8 times 900. Okay, that gives us about 720 plus 300. So altogether, I'm going to get my consumption function to equal $1,020. So there we go. That value right there, that was $1020. Okay. What? 
Is anyone else thrown off by that number? Does that seem odd to anybody else? Right? And, and just take a second to think about that. <clears throat> Our total income is 1000 Our income after tax is 900 But we're spending 1020 on cheeseburgers. How? How do we do this? How is this possible? Well, the way that we're doing this, the way that this is possible is that in this economy, these individuals are what we would call dissavers. That is, they are not saving. They are actually consuming beyond the income that they have. They are borrowing from future consumption in order to consume today. They are borrowing from their future in order to finance present period consumption. And we, we, we could see this. We could work out just the flip side of this. We could work out what their, what their level of savings are. And in order to think about that, right, how do we get the level of savings? Well, keep in mind, we have our disposable income. We have two options. We either take our disposable income and we eat it today. That was our consumption function. Alternatively, we take our disposable income and we save some of it so that we can eat it tomorrow. So, okay, consumption savings, these two parts together make up our total disposable income. So, hey, if at any point we could say disposable income will equal our consumption as a function of disposable income plus our savings. Well, hey, hey, there we go. Disposable income is just consumption plus savings. We know what consumption is. We know what our disposable income is. We can work out our we can work out our savings. So, okay, disposable income, what's that? Well, up here, we said that was 900. Our consumption, what was that? Well, we said that was 1020. What's our savings? Well, we don't know. That's what we're trying to find out. Now, a little bit of algebraic voodoo. So we want to get this savings by itself. So we move this 1020 to the other side. So 900 minus 1020. That yields for us minus 120 equals our savings. So that is, yes, it is possible for us to have negative savings. And that is, in that case there, if we have this negative rate of savings, we are just borrowers. We are borrowing from our future in order to finance our current, our present period consumption of cheeseburgers. Very similarly, just as we have our consumption function here, we would very similarly have a savings function. It would look a little bit different, but we could work it out through just essentially following the algebra of what we worked through here numerically. And let's just quickly, let's just quickly see that. So we said Y disposable income, and then we subtracted off our consumption, right? We did 900 minus 1020. So, hey, we did disposable income minus my consumption of given my disposable income, my consumption function equals my savings function. Okay, working that out. We know that this is a function, so we can open up its functional form. Let's do that. Disposable income minus, what's my consumption function? Marginal propensity to consume times my disposable income. Plus, I'll do my little fancy C there for autonomous consumption. We had that guy. Our consumption function, all of this is equal then to our savings function. Okay, bring in this negative. So, okay, negative times MPC, that gives me Y disposable income minus MPC times my disposable income. Multiply this minus all the way over to that small fancy C. We now get minus fancy C. Okay, a little bit of simplification we can do here still. Just like we did in our tax case, we can take a look at this and we can go, hey, hey, look at this. Disposable income. Disposable income, that's common to both. We can factor that out. Okay, we factor that out. We get Y disposable income times one minus 
our marginal propensity to consume minus our little fancy C there equals our savings function. Minus MPC. Hey, hey, we, we talked about that already. We did that right up here. MP save, the marginal propensity to save, was equal to 1 minus our marginal propensity to consume. So, hey, going back to there, we can, we can make that update. Disposable income times the marginal propensity to save minus our autonomous consumption equals our rate of savings or our savings function. If we wanted to view this as a graph, we could do that too. Very similarly, right? We can just write it a different way. We have our endogenous variable here. We have our exogenous variable here. That's not in the way we're used to seeing it. So let's just flip things around. We would say, okay, savings of disposable income is going to be equal to our marginal propensity to save times our disposable income minus our little fancy C there, our autonomous consumption. Now we have our slope. Now we have our vertical intercept. And we have our exogenous variable. And we have our endogenous variable. So let's go about graphing that quickly here. So what do we have? Endogenous variable, that's our vertical one. That is savings as a function of disposable income. We have our exogenous variable, that is our disposable income there. And then we want to throw in our vertical intercept. So, oh, look at this. Minus C. That is in this scenario here. What we actually want to be doing is we actually want to go into this other realm of our graphing coordinates, right? Of our plane, of our Cartesian plane, right? We technically have these four different coordinates available to us. Positive, positive. Uh, we have then negative, positive, negative, negative, and then again, positive, negative, right? As you went through all four areas of your Cartesian plane. We're really only going to be interested in these two. So in this case here, what we're going to have, minus C. So that'll be somewhere down like that, right? There we go. Minus, and then our little fancy C. Marginal propensity to save. Well, what's this guy going to be? Is this going to be positive or negative? Well, keep in mind, let's scroll up. Our marginal propensity to consume. Oh, sorry, I scrolled up for no reason. This page is what I was looking for. Our marginal propensity to consume was bounded between 0 and 1. That is... Our marginal propensity to save is 1 minus some number that has to be less than 1. Our marginal propensity to save will always be positive as well. That is, very similarly, our marginal propensity to save will also be bounded between 0 and 1. Because the marginal propensity to consume is. And the marginal propensity to save is then residual of that. So, it must be that case. So that is, we're going to have a positive slope once again, upward sloping, rise over run. That gives us our marginal propensity to save. And this guy here is our savings function. What's going on here? What's going on with this? How come sometimes we're below the horizontal axis, sometimes we're above? Well, okay. In the cases here where we are below, that is this bit here, right? Shaded in in red. Well, in these cases here, our consumption, right? Our value, our disposable income is so low that this autonomous consumption, the amount of money we need to spend just to, in order to meet our day-to-day -day obligations or our day-to-day -day wants and needs, well, our consumption is too high in order to be satisfied by just our disposable income alone. So in that case there, in order to satisfy our consumption, we need to borrow, right? And in this case here, we're borrowing from the future. We're borrowing from our future consumption in order to be able to eat today. As our disposable income rises, right? So as we get more and more and more disposable income, we end up in this realm over here. And in this case here, our disposable income is significantly high enough that 
hey, my base level of consumption is met. I'm now getting into some more nicer levels of consumption, but I now have more income than I need to eat today. So I begin to save some of it. I begin to put some of it aside. And uh, that was a funny S. I put aside and I begin to save. So I have my savings as my level of income rises. So in this bit here, we've seen our consumption function. We've seen the residual of that, our savings function. And we've seen that really in both of these, our consumption and our savings are induced. They are determined by our level of GDP, our level of income, right? We had income there. Income as our exogenous variable. We witness our level of income. We put it through this function and we get our level of consumption. We have a level of income. We put it into our function. It gets wrapped through and we get our level of consumption. So we have that working itself out there. And we see that, hey, our consumption is dependent on our income that we have. Okay. So that does us for our consumption function. Let's carry on with the rest of our expenditure-based model. So carrying on consumption after consumption is investment. Let's take a look at that. But just a quick aside before we jump apart, uh, jump aside. Let's talk about this marginal propensity to consume for a second here. <clears throat> so with this marginal propensity to consume, for our course, for our purposes, we will presume this is constant. This is constant and thus linear, right? And that is, hey, as we saw it here, marginal propensity consumed, just, just a flat line, right? Just flat line because it was a constant 80% all through our income. In reality, in reality, our consumption function is more likely to look something like this. We would have our consumption as a function of disposable income. We would have our disposable income. It would look more like, there's our base level of consumption. It would shoot up and then it would start to level out. That is in reality, our marginal propensity to consume is not constant. In reality, at low levels of income, so over here, low levels of disposable income, our marginal propensity to consume is going to be near one or at one. That is, hey, for every extra dollar we earn, that entire dollar goes towards cheeseburgers. We don't have the luxury of saving. So, hey, you give me a dollar, I spend that dollar because I need to. As incomes rise, as disposable incomes rise, our curve flattens out. And at really high levels of income, well, our marginal propensity to consume begins to approach zero. That is, at this point here, you give me an extra dollar, cool, thank you, I'm happy with this extra dollar, but hey, I've already bought all the clothes I want, I don't really need another pair of jeans, I don't really need another pair of shoes, I don't really need another sports car, I don't know what to do with this extra dollar. So, I'm going to save it. I'm going to save that entire dollar because all my consumption needs are net, net, and I don't have any consumption to do with it. So we see we can have these two extremes in reality. Typically, right, we work out, okay, on whole within an economy, we would have this Canadian marginal propensity to consume. And we could say, hey, that's something constant, something roughly linear over the realm we're looking at. In reality, we have distributional aspects to think about. We have those who are very rich in the economy. We have those that are very poor in the economy. In reality, those that are very rich likely have marginal propensity consumes close to zero. Those that are very poor, they will have a marginal propensity consume very close to one. And again, the rationale being just, what do you have available to you? What do you have available to you? So that last bit there. Okay, so we have our GDP through our expenditure approach. We have consumption, which we've now said, hey, it's not just consumption, it's this consumption function. We then have investment. So, okay, let's talk about investment. That's uh, autonomous. That is by autonomous, we mean it's not influenced by our GDP. 
So, okay, if it's not influenced by our GDP, there's no investment function. There's no correspondence between, hey, some change in income means some change in investment. What this means for our terms mathematically is that investment will just be given to us. Hey, current business investment is blank, right? Boom, there we go. There's our investment. So, hey, for now, let's just leave it at that. Let's just carry on. What else do we have? Well, we have our government expenditure. Well, again, government expenditure is just autonomous. That is, it's independent of our level of GDP. So again, what does that mean from our sense here? It means that government expenditure will just be given to us. Hey, the current government budget is X many dollars. This is how much they plan to spend on goods and services. Boom, there is our government expenditure. Okay. Exports, again autonomous, independent from GDP. Again, all that means for us is it will just be a value given to us. So, okay, we don't need to worry about that. What about the last one there, imports? Well, imports, again, we said was induced. So imports, we're going to bring that in, and imports is a function of output altogether. That is, hey, the more output we have, the more income we receive, the higher the level of GDP we have, well, the more stuff we're going to import. And where our consumption function, right? Some might say that was eh, pretty involved. We had our marginal propensity to consume times our disposable income. Actually, you know what? Sorry, I'm just going to change colors because I used that color for autonomous through this whole thing. So let's keep that constant. Marginal propensity to consume times disposable income plus autonomous, my little fancy C, right? That was my consumption function. Where that was a little bit involved, we then had plus investment, plus government expenditure, plus exports. Our import function, well, our import function is going to be actually fairly easy to work through. And that is our import function is just going to be minus, and I'm just going to do M, why? And okay, what what is that? What is M? What is Y? Well, okay, Y, Y is as we've defined it already. That is Y is GDP. Y is our income. Y is our output. So, okay, again, imports is induced. There's our induced port part fitting in there. So then what's M? Well, where MPC was our marginal propensity to consume. M here, M is our marginal propensity to import. And that is kind of, hey, what is our desire for imported goods? And right, this kind of goes back to how much trade do we take part in? Are we a big, right? Do we trade with a lot of people, right? This would be like a lot of European countries, say Germany, for example, lots of close borders. Huge amount of trade, right? Trade accounts for a large portion of their GDP. Or are we more a country like the US, where we have a lot of interstate trade, right? A lot of domestic trade, but we don't do a lot of trade with other countries because relative to the world, well, North America is kind of secluded, right? We have Canada, we have the US, we have Mexico, down south, all of the rest. But most of the trading partners, we have to cross a big sea to get to. As a result, as we saw in that previous video, well, the U.S. has a relatively smaller amount of trade that they take part in with respect to their total GDP. So this marginal propensity to import, just like with our marginal propensity to consume, is going to be bounded between 0 and 1. In that case there, again, what it's saying is, hey, we earn an extra dollar of income. How much of this extra dollar of income are we going to spend on foreign goods? If we had a marginal propensity to, of, to import of one, hey, every extra dollar of income we earn, we buy a foreign good with. Cool, I made more money, I'm going to go buy something from somebody else. If we have a marginal propensity to import of zero, we earn more money, we buy nothing from the world. We spend it all domestically, right? So zero would be that we just spend all of our money domestically. One would be that, hey, all of our money that we've earned, we've thrown back out to the world to buy their stuff. The two extremes there. So, okay. That's going to be our 
expenditure GDP kind of all brought out there. But I want to talk about these autonomous components here. Right? We've talked a lot about the induced components. We've seen that, okay, as GDP changes, it will influence right, our consumption function. Or you can see here, hey, as GDP goes up, my imports go up. As GDP goes down, my imports go down. But what about all this autonomous stuff? Right? Often we get into this trap where a lot of students end up just thinking, hey, autonomous means fixed. Autonomous just means it's some number and it doesn't change. It's just, hey, there we go. These are autonomous. These are fixed. And that's, a, that's not true. That's completely false. All autonomous means is that they don't move with GDP. But there are determinants of these that make them move on their own. So what I want to do here is quickly list, go through our determinants of each of these, and talk about the influence that it ends up having. So let's start off with our consumption here. Okay, so starting off with consumption. Our determinants of consumption are first and foremost, we will list expectations. And what do we mean by expectations? Well, I think I'm gonna get a big raise in the future. I think my job's pretty stable. I think this is gonna happen. I have a pretty positive outlook on the future and all of that. Well, I'm more likely to go and spend a bunch of money because, hey, I think I'm gonna have money in the future. So if I think I'm gonna have money in the future, I can eat it today. I don't need to save for tomorrow. So, hey, positive expectations, more consumption today. It's gonna to raise my baseline consumption. If I have negative expectations, so if I think, hey, maybe I'm going to get laid off in the next year. Maybe I won't have a job. Maybe my salary is going to get cut. Well, if that's the case, I'm thinking, man, it's going to be hard to eat what I need to eat next year. I'm going to have to put, away, put aside some money today. So if I have negative expectations, I would see a drop in my autonomous consumption. So positive expectations, here we can, we can write that down. Positive expectations, we would see consumption go up. Negative expectations, we would see autonomous consumption. Again, I want these to be these little fancy Cs. We're talking about autonomous consumption would go down. So first kind of determinant that we'll talk about in that case there. Next one. Next one is going to be wealth. <clears throat> it's how wealthy we feel, right? And this is going to be kind of our buildup of income that we've kind of squirreled away and how much wealth we have available to us. This could be, right, for our wealth, this could be essentially our net worth. All of our savings, like, hey, I have $100,000 in the bank in savings because I've been squirreling it away for years. Or, hey, I completely lucked out, bought a house back in 2010 and it was only 200,000 then and now it's worth something silly like a million dollars. All of a sudden, I have a million dollars of wealth, a million dollar net worth, just because I bought at the right time, right? And what we see in this case here is that as our wealth goes up, well, this is just a pool of money that we have to draw from, right? We can pull from this these reserves, as it were, and so more wealth, more wealth, more consumption. If I feel less wealthy, if my wealth starts taking a hit, well then less consumption. So that would play through in that kind of way. Okay, last one, last kind of determinant for our consumption is going to be our nominal interest rate. And the way to think about this nominal interest rate is two ways. A, you can think about it like, hey, you need to borrow some money to consume, right, in case you're a dis-saver. Or the other side is that you're a saver, and what are you going to do given the change in interest rates? So to start off, let's say that the interest rate goes up. So, okay, interest rate goes up. It used to be 2% interest rate on a car. It's now a 5% interest rate on that same car. Are you wanting to buy that car still? It's going to cost you more, right? So as interest rates go up, it becomes more expensive to finance your consumption. So that would mean that your consumption, little fancy C there, your consumption goes down. The other way to kind of think about that, right, is interest rates go up. 
you're getting a better return on your savings. So, hey, interest rates go up, you're more enticed to save, you so you start to save more. Savings, consumption, flip sides of the same coin. So more savings must mean less consumption. The flip of that then, everything's symmetric. So if interest rates are dropping, hey, it's really cheap to buy that car now. Financing is cheap. Alternatively, I get nothing for my savings, right? My savings hardly grow. I'm not getting any good interest rate on them. So low interest rate, interest rates falling, my consumption will rise. I'd rather eat it today than save it for tomorrow if I'm not getting a good return on those savings. So some things that are going to influence my autonomous consumption, and in that sense there, they will influence my consumption function as well. And let's just briefly take a look at how that influences my consumption function. So I have, oh, sorry, consumption as a function of disposable income. I have disposable income. I'm going to have, let's start off here. We'll say C naught, right? That's a little fancy C naught there. And then I have my marginal propensity to consume and my consumption function all together. Let's presume... Let's presume that all of a sudden I'm very optimistic about the future. I think I'm going to get a raise. I think, right, everything's going to be awesome. So who cares about tomorrow? I'll be good for tomorrow. Let's enjoy today. So positive expectation about the future, positive increase in my autonomous consumption. What does that mean? This little intercept here takes a little jump up. We'll call that C1, little fancy C1. And then that means, hey, new vertical intercept, still the same marginal propensity consumed. That, that hasn't changed, just a change in my autonomous consumption. So I'm going to have a parallel line. Best that I can draw that there is a parallel line. And I'm going to have my new consumption function. I'm going to do a little vertical line there, just meaning given, given my new level of consumption, right? And a little fancy C there for, hey, my new level of autonomous consumption. And essentially, hey, that's just caused my consumption function to shift up. All else equal, I have a positive view of the future. Given that positive view of the future, I'm going to consume more, right? And, and we can see that. We can see that. We can throw in fixed level of disposable income. Boom. Hey, maybe this is that 900 that we had previously worked out. Okay. 900, I used to be going across there. Uh, what did we say? 1020? Something like that, I think, is what we worked that out on that initial consumption function. Boom, I have these positive expectations about the future. Nothing can go wrong. Let's just eat it all today. Well, in that case there, no change in disposable income, right? Disposable income still 900. But because of this change in my expectations, Boom, my consumption function moves up. And now I have this new value of consumption altogether. Now we can work it out. Let's suppose it's something like 1100. I'd have to know what my new value of C1 is in order to work out the new value of consumption. But if we had that, we could just work it out. It's just, it's just algebra, right? So just to kind of demonstrate how that works through. And hey, changes in disposable income. I move along my current consumption function, giving me different readouts of consumption. Changes in expectations, changes in wealth, changes in interest rates. That's going to move my entire consumption function, thus again, moving my level of consumption. So we see how that guy plays out. What do we have next? Next we have, let's not use blue. Uh, there we go. Next we have investment. What's going to change our levels of investment, right? Keep in mind, there's no line like this. There's no investment function like we have here for our consumption function. It's just strictly our value of investment. Well, some things that are going to influence this are, again, our expectations. So in this case here, we mean business expectations. Do we think that, hey, we're going to have booming business in the next few years? Well, hey, if we're expecting business to expand in five years' time, we need to buy new capital today because it takes time to build that factory. It takes time to build up those inventories. 
So if we're expecting business to boom in the future, we need to start building up that investment in capital. So hey, positive expectations, investment goes up. I'm not too sure about the future. That is, I have negative expectations. Uh, maybe we're not going to sell so much next year. Well, maybe I need to start liquidating some of my capital. Uh, we're not going to sell so much next year. So I'm going to start to decrease my inventories, right? I don't need to carry around as much inventories if I'm not going to be selling as much. So negative expectations about the future. I'm not going to put it into investment. I'm going to drop my level of investment. So again, expectations play into it there. Next one, next one is going to be an unexpected, I'm not writing unexpected, but I do mean that, an unexpected change in sales. And this one throws a lot of people, a lot of people get really confused about this one here. So the way we want to think about this with this unexpected change in sales is that firms, companies, well, they carry around inventory and they kind of want to match, they kind of want to maintain a level of inventory to sale ratio. They don't want too much inventories because, hey, too much inventories is just too much stuff sitting on shelves. That has a cost off for to it. They also don't want too little inventory because too little inventory means the shelves look bare or somebody comes in to ask for something and you don't have it and they go to a competitor. You don't want that either. So there's kind of this optimal ratio of inventory to sales. Okay. What happens if sales booms, we've had an unexpected increase in our inventories. Oh, sorry. Wow. We've had an unexpected increase, an unexpected surge in our sales. Okay. We've had this huge increase in sales, this unexpected jump in sales. What does this do? Well, this draws down, this depletes, writing this small here, this depletes our inventories. So that is initially, these sales are skyrocketing. Where are all these sales coming from? What are you selling? Well, you're selling all your inventory. But what does this mean? It means your inventories are shrinking. You don't have enough inventories now in the next period for your level of sales. So what do you need to do? Well, given this drop in existing inventories, you need to increase your investment in future inventories. This spike in sales needs to result in a spike in investment inventory. So positive boom in sales means you're going to have an increase in investment. Alternatively, you have this negative change in sales. You thought it was going to be a great Christmas season and it turns out no one's buying anything. Oh no, your inventories are piling up. Right? You're having so much stock on the shelves, you don't even know where to put it. You're piling it in the stock room, you're piling it in the staff room, bathrooms, right? You just have stock everywhere. You have too much inventory. Well, okay, what does that tell you? In that case there, that means you need to scale back how much stuff you're producing, scale back your inventory investment, and start to sell off some of your existing stock. So drop in sales, unexpected drop in sales results in a drop in inventory investment. Final guy here, final guy is our real interest rate. So, hey, for consumers, we set our nominal interest rate. For businesses, we want to say our real interest rate. Keep in mind, these are implicitly linked together. If you recall our Fisher equation, we said that the real interest rate was equal to the nominal minus our expected level of inflation. So, oh, that was, there we go, the expected level of inflation. So we see here that they are implicitly linked. If inflation was zero, they'd be one and the same. And then for whatever value of inflation is, that's just the differential between them. So, yeah, we're separating them, but they are implicitly linked to each other there. What's going on here? Well, if the real interest rate, oh, let's go and use the same color there. If the real interest rate were to go, up that is again in real terms your cost of borrowing is going up and keep in mind for a lot of these firms they want to go build a new factory they want to go expand their capital well hey typically a new factory that's pretty expensive buying a whole bunch of new capital that's expensive if the real interest rates going up that's hey an increase in the cost of credit the cost of borrowing the cost of financing that new purchase 
Ah, increase of that is increasing your cost of doing so. So as we have a rise in real interest rates, we will see a fall in business investment. Alternatively, real interest rates are low. Well, if real interest rates are low, well, this is that kind of situation where it's really cheap to borrow to build that new factory. It's really cheap to buy a new fleet of vehicles because the rate that you're paying, that borrowing your cost of credit is near zero or low. So dropping real interest rates, dropping real interest rates will increase our business investment. So, okay. Redeterminants there of investment and how they are going to end up influencing that. Don't worry, right? You're like, what, is, what does this mean? We'll work through some examples shortly here, right? As to how this all plays in. Essentially, what I'm really trying to get at though is yes, we'll say investments autonomous, just boom, here's a number representing our investment. If we have a change in expectations, all of a sudden I have a positive view of the future. Are we going to have more investment or less investment? Right? That's really what we're trying to work out with this is trying to work out directional impacts. Okay, next guy there, government expenditure. Well, we're running out of room, let's go all the way down here. Government expenditure, well, government expenditure just, uh, it is whatever we say it is, right? I mean, if not, why would we say it is? So it's just, there we would put it, it's government expenditure, whatever the government says, hey, this is what we're expending this year. There's not going to be any determinants to it. We're not going to say, hey, expectation, sales, interest rates, anything like that. It's just as set by the government. And so as a result, if it changes, it's because the government's just saying they're changing it. They're saying, hey, you know what? Mid-year update on our budget. Something's happened. We need to spend a whole bunch more money now. Or, hey, something's happened, well, we're going to be spending less money, right? Same kind of idea. So just entirely dictated by the government what they're planning to expend. Final guy here is going to be our exports, what we sell to others. So this guy here, there's going to be two factors that influence this. First factor, first one is going to be relative prices. Okay, so relative prices is going to be the relation between cost of good in Canada, cost of good in the U.S., cost of good in Canada, cost of good in China, right? And let's just presume, right, we talked about this with trade and how we'll stabilize to a law of one price, but with exchange rates, sometimes we temporarily have little blips. We have temporary little changes in that. And so what happens is, hey, if all of a sudden Canadian t-shirts are relatively cheap, Due to a change in exchange rates, well, foreigners are going to be buying more Canadian t-shirts. That is, we're going to have a surge in exports of Canadian t-shirts due to that change in relative price between Canadian and U.S. t-shirts. So changes in exchange rates will cause a change in our exports as we restabilize through our law of one price. What else is going to impact this? Well, what else is going to impact this is going to be foreign. Oh, there we go. Foreign income or we can write that another way we can go gdp subscript foreign and why why would that be the case well why would that be the case is because hey take a look our imports are dependent on our gdp the more gdp we have the more stuff we import our imports are other countries' exports, right? In the same way, our exports are other countries' imports. So very similarly, they have an import function, which is their marginal propensity import times GDP. The more GDP they have, the more stuff they want to buy. The less GDP they have, the less stuff they want to buy. So, GD oh, again, let's keep the same colors here. You have a decrease in foreign income, and you're going to have a decrease in exports. You have an increase in foreign income, and you're going to have an increase in exports. 
Oh, look at that. I jumped right over relative prices, right? We talked about it, but we didn't explicitly write it down. So let's, let's go back and talk about relative prices with that as well. So let's start off by talking about an appreciation. So an appreciation, the Canadian dollar is now worth more relative to the American dollar. So Hey, all of a sudden we're at parity, a dollar for a dollar with the US. Currently it's something like, hey, a dollar Canadian buys you a buck 20 American, about that. If we went to parity, well, hey, now the Canadian dollar is going up. If our Canadian dollar is going up, what's going to happen? Are we going to want to buy more American stuff or are they going to want to buy more of our stuff? Well, hey, if our dollar goes up, American stuff looks cheaper. That is, from the American's perspective, our stuff looks more expensive. So in the case of an appreciation of currency, exports will fall. In the case, the opposite case there, if we have a case of depreciation, if we have a case of depreciation, so our dollar is dropping in value, as our dollar drops in value, our stuff looks relatively cheap to foreigners. If our stuff looks relatively cheap to foreigners, they want to buy it because of this change in relative prices. So this depreciation of the dollar will cause our exports to increase. So appreciation is a drop in exports, depreciation a rise in exports. So, okay, wow, we have a lot going on there. We have our expenditure form of GDP. We have it opened up into induced and autonomous components. And then for all these autonomous components, we've said, hey, these are all the things that influence them. You will need these. You will need all these things that influence the autonomous components. You will need to keep them in your back pocket so that, hey, when we say the Canadian dollar appreciates, you can kind of work through, oh, well, what does that mean? Oh, the Canadian dollar is appreciated. Exports are going to drop. If exports drop, well, hey, exports just enter in linearly here. Less exports means less GDP. And you can work through that, right? You can kind of think through logically how that all works through. But now let's work, right? We've gone through all the components of this. Let's actually build our model. Let's actually build our Keynesian cross. Let's jump to a new page and let's do that. Okay, so we have our expenditure form opened up like we've seen it in the previous page. It's just now on its own. I've color coordinated it such that the green is our induced, the red is our autonomous. And it, it looks pretty ugly, to be honest, right? There's a lot going on there. It's what, what does it all mean? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to collapse it down. And we're going to work out from this our first kind of model, that Keynesian cross of explaining our economy. And in order to do so, what we want to do is we want to link together the green parts, the induced components, and we want to link together the red parts, the autonomous components. And keep in mind that really all those red parts, those autonomous components, those would be, if we had the values for them, they would just be a number. And that is, right, to give us an example of it, it would just look something like this on the right. So you'd have something like this showing you all of the components of GDP, right? So it'd be, hey, our marginal propensity to consume is 0.8. Our tax rate is 10%. Our autonomous consumption is 300, autonomous investments 500, autonomous government expenditure five, 250, sorry, and our autonomous exports 150. Our marginal propensity to import is 0 0.15. That is, right, like I said, hey, all of these autonomous components, they are just some number, which means, hey, what we could do is we could just add all these together. 300 plus 500, well, that's 800. 800 plus 250, well, that's 1050 plus 150 is going to be 1100, 1200, right? So altogether, this is going to be 1200. And what we can do then is just algebraically speaking, well, what if we don't know those numbers? What if we don't know what's going on? What we can do instead is we can just call all of these autonomous components. Well, hey, they're all autonomous. Let's just call them A, right? And yeah, here in this case, we have the numbers. We worked out they were 1,200. But outside of that, well, we can just call them A. And A is equal to C plus I plus G plus X. So, okay, let's, let's rewrite our formula in that sense there. 
Y equals our marginal propensity to consume, disposable income plus all of this. Well, that's just A. Plus, oh, sorry, not plus. Minus our marginal propensity to import times Y. Okay, so that, that helped clean things up a little bit. Now let's do the same to our green parts, our induced parts. Well, if we take a look at this, well, oh, we have disposable income and we have income, right? These are not the same, they're different. But, hey, hey, we do know that disposable income, so disposable income is equal to, if we open up that guy, one minus our tax rate times Y, and then plus A, well, hey, two minus three, or minus three plus two, that's gonna give you the same value no matter what. So let's just rewrite this. Let's just go instead of plus A minus MY, let's go minus MY plus A. There we go. And let's, let's work through this. So, okay, I put around these square brackets here just to say, hey, this is disposable income going to there but they don't actually mean anything to, for us because, hey, this is all multiplication anyways. There's no addition or anything happening. This is marginal to consume times one minus T times Y. So, hey, all of that's in there. But what we notice is that, oh, let's not use red, red's for autonomous. We have Y here. We have Y there. Now, okay, so what, common to both, we can, Factor that out, just like we've been doing a few times now. So, okay, we have GDP on this side, Y equals, and let's put this all in brackets, marginal propensity to consume times one minus T minus M times Y, right? So, right to see, hey, did that actually work? Did we just break laws of math? No, no, no. Do your FOIL first, outside, inside, last. Multiply your y back in, y times MPC 1 minus t, well, the y shows up there. y times minus m, y shows up there. Ah, we're good, right? We have what we're looking for. And then, of course, we have plus a. Okay, did that really help us at all? Well, it doesn't look like it. It looks like, well, okay, we've just rearranged some stuff, but it's just as ugly, just as messy. But, ah, it did actually, because... This whole garbly goop here that we have in the square brackets, we actually have a special name for that. And that is, we would call all of that in the square brackets our marginal propensity to spend, right? So, okay, keep in mind earlier, whenever I was referring to the marginal propensity to save, I was always writing down MP save, right? That was on purpose because in this case here, we have our marginal propensity to spend, Right, and I'm not gonna write this every time, but that is to spend, MPS. And what this is saying is for every extra dollar of output created, every extra dollar of income, how much of that is going to be spent domestically? How much of it is gonna be spent domestically? And so what we get is our GDP is gonna be equal to our marginal propensity to spend, times our income, our current level of GDP, plus our autonomous expenditure. How much we're just going to be expending by default, irrespective of our value of GDP, on consumption, investment, government, and exports. And so what we get is, hey, if you're looking at that, that's kind of, again, just like our whole bit here of Y equals mx plus b and yeah again right that looks that looks very similar with that but hey you're looking at this and you're like well wait wait y equals y couldn't we just get those together and get rid of them well yes we could but what we're going to do in this case here is we're going to clarify that in this model what we're working out is yeah okay GDP is a function of consumption investment government and net exports but in this case here we're focusing on our expenditure 
this model we've built, this Keynesian cross, isn't actually measuring our GDP necessarily. What it's measuring for us is two different ways you'll see this. You'll either see this written as your aggregate expenditure, or the way that I like to refer to it is your planned aggregate expenditure. And that is saying, hey, on whole, all of our expenditure within the economy on whole, keep in mind, that's what we're looking at, our expenditure approach. This is how much we are planning to expend on whole within our economy within a given time period. And that is, this is essentially our budget, right? This is our plan for the year as to how much money we're going to spend. And if you've ever created a budget, you know that no budget survives first contact. This is the same kind of idea. This is our budget. This is what we are planning to expend that, hey, it's going to be dependent on our actual level of GDP, what we actually witness, how much we just have to spend. If you think about this in your personal budget kind of way, this is like how much you have to spend on rent, how much you have to spend on your cell phone bill, on all these requirements, right? These are the things that are stuck. You have to spend this amount of money irrespective of your income. As your income goes up, well, you're going to spend more money on little fun things. But it's going to be some base level of expenditure plus some extra amount depending on what your level of income ends up doing. So what we end up getting here is this planned aggregate expenditure is equal to our marginal propensity to spend times our actual witnessed income plus our level of autonomous expenditure. In this, marginal propensity to spend, well, if we take a look at it, marginal propensity to consume, bounded between zero and one. Tax rate, not technically that guy as well, bounded between zero and one. Marginal propensity to import, bounded between zero and one. So, okay, all of these components here are bounded between zero and one, meaning that our marginal propensity to spend is bounded between zero and one as well. And if we want to think about that, like we said, that is essentially our Y equals MX plus B. That is, we just have a new line to look at here. And let's take a look at that. So we have our planned aggregate expenditure. That's our exogenous variable there. Sorry, endogenous variable. We have our level of GDP, Y, that is our exogenous variable. Starting off with our vertical intercept A there, that is our autonomous expenditure A. We then have our slope. Well, our slope is our marginal propensity to spend bounded between zero and one. There we go. Rise over run. That gives me my marginal propensity to spend. And what I get here is my planned aggregate expenditure function. And okay, cool, we did all this, and for what? This graph looks almost exactly the same as our consumption function. In fact, it looks pretty much identical. We just have different labels for everything. Yeah, almost, right? Fundamentally different than what we're measuring. What we also want to throw into this, though, we want to throw into this another line. We want to throw into this a 45 degree line, a 45 degree line such that along this line, we have a situation such that our planned aggregate expenditure equals our actual output, our actual level of GDP. And what it turns out, this is the big crux of this whole model, is that in this case here with our consumption function, we did it. We just said, hey, look, here's our consumption. We take our disposable income, throw it in, and we get some level of consumption. In this model, we actually get an equilibrium. We get an equilibrium right where these two equal, right where these two lines cross, such that at that point there, some level of GDP will result in some level of planned aggregate expenditure, such that we have equilibrium and stability. Right? And that's the big part there stability. And so in order for this to be an equilibrium, let's talk about why. Why does that have to be an equilibrium? And in order to talk about why that's the case, let's take a look at a scenario 
where we have GDP that's kind of below this equilibrium. All right, so if we had GDP below this equilibrium, so there I'm gonna have YL for Y low. Well, that's gonna be bouncing over here, Y to Y, that would give me my value of Y low there. But that's gonna bounce up to the planned aggregate expenditure curve. That's something like that. Oh, let's use the right tool there. Planned aggregate expenditure. So, hey, at this point here, I'm going to have aggregate expenditure above income. Or I'm going to have aggregate expenditure, what I'm planning to expend, how much money I want to spend, higher than my actual expenditure currently is, or higher than my actual current income is. That is, if you think about this, I am planning to buy more stuff than currently we're producing. So what begins to happen with that? Well, if I'm planning to buy more stuff than there currently is for output, I begin to draw down my inventories, right? Because I'm planning to buy all this stuff, I'm buying it up. This is drawing down my inventories. As I draw down my inventories, firms have to react. Firms react by increasing their investment in inventories. Hey, new inventories is new investment. New investment, more investment is more GDP. More GDP is an increase in output. Output increases. As output increases, I make my way to this point here, which I will call Y prime. Y prime being my equilibrium level of national income, my equilibrium level of output. So GDP lower than our equilibrium level of national output. Well, we're going to be planning to expend more, planning to buy more stuff than currently exists, drawing down our inventories. Firms respond by increasing investment in inventories. This increase in investment pushes up GDP. Alternative side, what's the other story? Well, the other story, we'll start off up here. So we start off up here at a high level of GDP. Something's pushed us to this high level of GDP. Okay, at this high level of GDP, we have our actual level of output, how much we're actually producing, right? So off the yellow line would be the corresponding actual level of GDP. Off the blue line is what we're planning to expend, how much stuff we're planning to buy. That is essentially our demand for stuff, our demand for goods and services. In this case, well, we have a lot more output. We have a lot more stuff being produced than we're planning to buy. So if you want to think about it in that same kind of context, our inventories are starting to build up. We're not selling all the stuff we're producing. So firms don't want this huge explosion of inventories. So what firms do is they react by cutting their investment. As they cut their investment in inventories because there's not as much sales, there's not as much demand as they thought there was going to be. Less investment in inventories means less output. Less output, well, that means we are moving this way towards our equilibrium level of national income. So that is the big thing of this model is that we have our equilibrium level of national income, we have our equilibrium level of GDP when our planned aggregate expenditure equals GDP. So okay, how can we take advantage of that fact? How can we take advantage of that fact? What can we do with that? Well. Well, let's go utilize what we have over here, just highlighted on the right-hand side there. Let's go utilize that and work through this and actually numerically solve this. So let's go take a look. There we go. We have our model. So let's just start off at the start. Say, hey, my planned aggregate expenditure equals consumption, investment, government, net exports. Okay, let's start opening things up. My planned aggregate expenditure model equals consumption. Well, that's my consumption function. So marginal propensity to consume times my disposable income. Well, let's just open that up right away. One minus T times Y plus my autonomous consumption. Okay, so all of that, that is all my consumption function. Then plus investment plus government expenditure, plus, well, let's open up our net exports. We have 
exports minus imports. So, okay, plus exports minus imports. Imports are induced. MY. Okay, now that we have it all open like this, well, we could just algebraically go through like we did in the last case, or we could start substituting in numbers now. And hey, let's do that. Let's start substituting in numbers now. Oh, sorry, I just noticed I made a mistake here. MPC 1 minus T times Y. Oh, no, never mind. There's the Y right there. I didn't make a mistake. We're good. I misspoke. Okay, let's start substituting in. So we have our planned aggregate expenditure. It's going to equal our marginal propensity to consume. That is 0 0.8 times 1 minus tax rate, 1 minus 0 0.1. So 1 minus 0.1, I'm just going to go right ahead and say that's 0 0.9 times Y plus C. Well, that's 300 plus investment. That's 500 plus government expenditure. That's 250 plus exports. That's 150. Minus marginal propensity import times y. So minus 0.15y. Okay? Just like we did before, let's simplify things down. So we're going to get our planned aggregate expenditure. All of our autonomous components. Hey, those are just numbers. They add up. All of our induced components. Well, you see they're all attached to y. They're similarly just going to add up. So what do we get? We have 0.8 times 0.9 minus 0.15. That's going to give me 0.57y plus all of my autonomous. We already worked that out. 1,200. So there we go. We have our planned aggregate expenditure function. If, if we want to take a look at that with our numbers now, we're going to have vertical axes, planned aggregate expenditure, horizontal axes, GDP. We're going to have that equilibrium line, that is our 45 degree line, such that along that line, GDP, planned a, GDP Y income output equals our planned aggregate expenditure. And then we're going to have our planned aggregate expenditure line. So starting off at our autonomous expenditure, 1,200, right? That's our autonomous expenditure. Having a slope to it of rise over run. That's our marginal propensity to spend. I get my planned aggregate expenditure curve. Where these two intercept one another, drawing that down, that is my value of Y prime. So how do I solve for that? How do I get that value of Y prime? Well, the way we do that is we set Y equal to our planned aggregate expenditure. That's, that's what we said, right? Right there on that line, boom, right there. Y equals planned aggregate expenditure. That is my equilibrium. So, okay, Y equals PAE. Well, what's PAE? PAE equals that. So, okay, Y equals 0.57Y plus 1,200. And we see here, okay, we have Y. We have Y. That's the only unknown. Hey, we can get these Ys together, isolate them, rearrange everything else, and solve for them. So, hey, let's do that. Let's do that. So we get y minus 0.57y equals 1,200. Cool. Y is common to both, so let's factor it out. We get y is 1 minus 0.57 equals 1,200. Let's get this y by itself now. And to get this y by itself, we divide both sides by 1 minus 0.57. And we get, I'm going to write this a bit of a funny way compared to what you're used to, but mathematically it's the same thing. Times 1,200. Right? And the way that you're typically, you're like, well, why don't you just do 1,200 divided by that, right? Why did you do times 1,200? Well, there's a reason for that, and let's let's take a look at that. So what we have is we have this funny term here, this fractional term, and then we have our autonomous. 
right? This 1200. That's our autonomous expenditure right there. What does this work out to? Well, let's work that out. One divided by one minus 0.57. We get, I'm just going to use a few decimal places. I'm not going to go completely crazy with that. We have that Y GDP, and really this is our Y prime. This is our equilibrium GDP, is going to be equal to 2. Point, uh, let's go 3256 times our autonomous expenditure. Now, what, what, what is this value here? Why did I want to separate this out? Why am I saying this is an important value? Right? Oh, here we go. I put A. Yeah, that's not wrong, but it has a number. We know what that number is. 1,200. There we go. Times 1,200. So what is this value? Why am I separating it out? This value here, this is known as our multiplier. This multiplier is telling us for every dollar in the economy, how many times does it cycle around our circular flow diagram, right? We put an extra dollar in. We put an extra dollar into this economy, an extra dollar of output. Well, that extra dollar of output is going to go around our circular flow diagram. As it goes around, little parts of it fall off. Little parts of it go away on imports. Little parts of it get sucked up into savings. Little parts of it get sucked off into taxes. Only so much of it, only a little bit in each circuit end up back at the firms to get paid out in new wages, rent, profits, interest income to end up back at the household. So now you get a little bit more money back at the household. It goes around again. It goes around again. Each cycle, it gets a little bit smaller, 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 such that every dollar in circulation in this economy will go through that circular flow diagram 2.3, almost 2.33 times before it peters out to essentially nothing. In this sense here, we have our multiplier, we have our autonomous expenditure. These two together give us our total value of GDP. So what does that work out to? 2.3256 times our 1200. That gives us total value of GDP of 2,790 and 72 cents. So given this layout of our economy that we're evaluating, given the marginal dependence to consume, the tax rate, all of these autonomous components and our marginal dependence to import, we get a level of GDP. And that's, for this purposes here, where we're going with this, is calculating a value of GDP based off of a bunch of information about an economy. Let's go back, let's go jump back to that circular flow diagram. And let's just really talk about this multiplier quickly, just to really ingrain this. Okay, so let's talk about this multiplier. Let's talk about this marginal propensity to spend to make sure we fully understand what's happening with this. So in this case here, we have an extra dollar. So plus one dollar heading into the household. Now, out of this extra dollar of output heading into the household, right away we lose... 10 cents to taxes. So minus 10 cents, right? That's going that way. What we're left with is we're left with a disposable income of 90 cents. Of that 90 cents, we have our marginal propensity to consume of 0.8. So 0.9 times 0.8, that gives us 72 cents going towards consumption. What's happening to the rest of that, right? We had 90 cents all together after our, right? So 0 0.90, sorry, we lost, we lost 10 cents to taxes. So out of that dollar, we had 90 cents into the household. 72 cents, that is 80% went towards consumption. 0.9, that is our 90 cents minus our 72 cents would be 18 cents going towards savings. So, okay, out of this dollar that hit our households, only 72 cents of it is going through into consumption, that is continuing through this cycle. But then out of this 72 cents that hits our goods and services market, some of the goods and services we buy are gonna be from domestic firms. 
Some of them are going to be from imported firms. So what we want to take a look at is our marginal propensity to import. And we're taking a look and we're saying, hey, 12 cents of every dollar is being imported. So, okay, 72 cents going towards consumption. 12 cents worth of imports. So, okay, 72. 12 is going towards out towards the world, meaning that out of the 72 cents going back to domestic firms is only 60 cents. So, okay, 60 cents goes into firms. This 60 cents into firms then comes back up and we get plus 60 cents. Oh, sorry, not plus $60. I'm dealing with a single dollar. So plus 0 0.6. Right, and then now this whole thing repeats. Hey, we have a bonus of 60 cents hitting our household again. Well, out of this 60 cents hitting our household, 60 cents, well, we're gonna lose some to taxes. So we're gonna lose six cents this time. Out of that, we're gonna have leftover, uh, right? We're gonna now have 0 0.54 as the new amount of money that we have as disposable income. Out of that 54 cents, we're going to have 80% of it that we consume. So 54 cents, 80% of that, we're going to put 0 0.4, what, 32 towards consumption, the rest into savings. So what is that? That's going to be 10 cents into savings. Out of this, 43.2 cents into consumption. Well, 12% of this amount here is going to go out to the world. So 12 times 0.6 means we're going to lose 0 0.072, 7.2 cents. So, okay, 43 cents, 43.2 cents going to our goods and services market. Minus the stuff going out to the world. What do we have? We have 36 cents going back into our firm again. Okay, cool. So 36 cents going back into our firm again. That's going to come up here plus 0 0.36, right? And then you see, okay, plus we lose some to taxes. Some goes to consumption. Some goes to savings. Wraps around. We saw that this single dollar actually cycles around this system several times. We work out how many times that single dollar works its way through our economy using that multiplier. And the value of that multiplier is equal to 1 over 1 minus our marginal propensity to spend. That guy there, that is equal to Z, which is our multiplier. How many times a single dollar will multiply its way around our economy given that dollar entered. So that's the idea behind our multiplier. That's what we have there. Okay, to wrap up, we've gone through a lot. This has been quite a long video. Sorry, right? Keep in mind, in our traditional face-to-face -face lecture time, we have two hours for this, and typically two hours is more than utilized to get through this. This is a big topic. We really want to get through this in good detail. Hopefully you split it up. You watched it maybe in two parts, but hey, big long video, lots to take away. What have we covered? We've covered this building of our Keynesian cross. We have covered, hey, that our Keynesian cross model is an expenditure-based model. From that, it has induced, it has autonomous components. We can bring those all together and we can create, hey, this is what our planning of aggregate expenditure is, given what a current level of aggregate expenditure is, given all these variables in our economy on whole, we can put all of it together. We can recognize that in equilibrium, based off of our marginal propensity to spend, or consume, based off of our tax rate, consumption, investment, government, exports, marginal propensity to import, all of that together will give us some level of equilibrium level of national income, some level of equilibrium national output, and we can work through that. So far, that's all we've done. We've said, hey, look, here's a list of numbers. What is our equilibrium level of national output? What I want to take a look at to wrap up this video, last quick example for this video, and I'll be putting together another video going through a few more of these, is I want to say, here's our starting condition. 
what is our equilibrium level of national income? From that, we have some change. All of a sudden, the interest rate has changed. All of a sudden, the exchange rate has changed. All of a sudden, expectations of the future have changed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Given this change, how does that filter through to impact our economy? Does GDP increase? Does GDP decrease? What is the impact of it? So let's take a look at an example like that. And let's just steal the same information to start off, actually. So, okay, let's carry on with this information. Same kind of thing. The only thing I've updated is just to make our marginal propensity to spend a little bit nicer. I've updated our marginal propensity to import to being 12 cents instead of 15 cents. So we're going to get a different value as you work through it, but hey, that's okay. Let's start off by solving for equilibrium level of national income. So to do so, let's start off with our PAE. Right, PAE is consumption, investment, government, and net exports. Opening up consumption, we have marginal propensity to consume. Disposable income, that's one minus our tax rate, times our income, plus our autonomous consumption. Then we have investment, we have government expenditure, and we have our net exports, which is exports minus our marginal propensity import times our level of GDP. Okay, from here we can start to plug and play. So we have planned aggregate expenditure equal to marginal propensity to consume 0.8. 1 minus our tax rate is 0.9 times y plus our, I'm just going to cheat here. I'm going to say, hey, Consumption, investment, government, exports, that's all A. I know that's 1,200, so rather than taking another step, I'm just going to go boom, 1,200. Minus marginal propensity import, 0.12Y. Consolidating everything together, that's going to give us our planned aggregate expenditure is going to be 0.6Y plus 1,200. Where did that 0.6 come from? 0.8 times 0.9 gives us 0 0.72. 0.72y minus 0.12y gives us 0.6y. Okay, let's graph quickly this Keynesian cross. We have on our vertical axes our planned aggregate expenditure. On our horizontal axes, we have our GDP. We have our equilibrium condition such that. 45 degree line, y equals planned aggregate expenditure along it. And then we have our line starting at an autonomous expenditure of 1200 going up. So there we go, that was our autonomous of 1200. We had a marginal propensity to spend of 0 0.60. We had our initial planned aggregate expenditure. And at that initial planned aggregate expenditure, we have our initial value of Y prime. I'll call that Y prime naught. Okay, let's start off by solving for this initial value of GDP, Y prime naught. So, equilibrium condition, Y equals planned aggregate expenditure. So, Y equals PAE, PAE equals this. So, Y equals 0.6Y plus 1200. Going through our algebraic voodoo, we get y prime equals 1 over 1 minus 0 0.6, right? And I jumped a few steps there. You can jump back to see that we moved this 0 0.6 over. We got the y put apart, and then we divided it back over here times 1200. So y prime equals our multiplier. That's 1 over 1 minus 0.6. That gives us a multiplier of 2.5 times 1,200. That's a equilibrium level of national income of 1,200 times 2.5. We get 3,000 as our equilibrium level of GDP. Y prime not. Y prime not, 3,000 right there. Okay, so great. We worked through that. Again, not so bad. It's intimidating. There's a lot of variables, a lot of stuff going on, but 
once you get the method down with practice, it's, it's not so bad to work through because it's the same thing every time, which is very helpful. But what do we do if we have if we have a shock? What if we have something that hits this economy and things change? For example, the way that you'd see this worded is something along these lines, such that, hey, general consensus is that the future is looking bright and promising, with both consumers and businesses extremely optimistic about the future. The result of this is a absolute value of the change in C equaling 50, and an absolute value of the change in I, investment, being a change in 25. Now, okay, what people end up doing is they look at this and they go, okay, you're just telling me change in C is 50 and change in, oh, no, not change in C again. Change in I is 25. But no, 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 that's not what I'm necessarily telling you. I'm telling you that the absolute value of the change in each one is 50 and 25. That is absolute value of something is ignoring the negative sign. You have to determine whether or not this is going to be a positive or a negative impact on consumption and investment. You have to determine the sign. I'm just telling you which variable is being impacted and the magnitude of the impact. You have to go, you need to work out the sign based off of the determinants of those autonomous variables that we talked about. In this case, if you just made that assumption that these were positive changes, well, you'd be right, right? Optimistic about the future, that is, we have good expectations about the future, that's expectations of being of consumption, expectations being of investment, and as a result, we would have plus 50 to C and plus 25 to I. Keep in mind, hey, both consumption and investment, they're just part of autonomous, so really we're just seeing plus 75 to our autonomous expenditure. That's all that that works out to. So, hey, what we can work that out. Currently, currently autonomous expenditure was 1200. We've just had this change being a new level of autonomous that's plus 75. So, hey, that's going to be now 1275. We've had no changes to our marginal propensity to spend, no changes to the marginal propensity to consume, the tax rate, or our propensity to import. So the marginal propensity to spend staying the same. The result of that, same slope, parallel shift of the line, best that I can there. And we would have our new planned aggregate expenditure given our new consumption and our new investment. So given C1 and I1, right? And that has been just a shift up there of plus 75. Okay. So given that, we need to work out, we want to work out, what is our new equilibrium value of GDP? That is, what is our new Y prime 1, our new equilibrium national income? Well, we can solve this. We now just have a new updated planned aggregate expenditure function. That is... Planned aggregate expenditure is going to be equal to, same slope, 0.6y plus autonomous, well, hey, autonomous used to be 0.6y plus 1200, we're now plus 1275, because we have this plus 75 to autonomous. Hey, we can just go through and resolve this now. We can set our equilibrium condition, y equals BAE. That is y equals 0 0.6y plus 1275. Go through all that algebraic voodoo. We get our y prime equal to 1 over 1 minus 0 0.6 times 1275. That's y prime is 2.5. That's our multiplier times our autonomous, 1275. Okay. Work that out, what do we get? 2.5 times 1275. We get our new value of equilibrium GDP, Y prime one of 31.87.50. And there we go. There's our new answer as to the impact this 
plus 75 of autonomous expenditure ended up having on our GDP. Okay, you might have noticed two things as we've gone through this. First thing is that we can always simplify through this model that, hey, our equilibrium level of GDP is always equal to our multiplier times our autonomous expenditure. Yes, yes, that's true, right? So a little bit of a trick. You can always jump to this step if you know the information and get your equilibrium level of GDP that way. The other thing you may have noticed, and this one's a little bit more tricky, you might not have noticed this one as easily, is that our change, our change in Y prime, we went from 31, sorry, we went to 31.8750 from 3,000, that is, okay, our change in equilibrium national income was 187.50. And why did that happen? Well, that happened because we had a change in autonomous of plus 75, right? This was a plus change in that for a plus change in that. You might notice there's a relationship between these two. That is 75. Our change in autonomous times our multiplier. So Z times our change in autonomous. That's a times. Z multiplier times our change in autonomous would equal our change in our equilibrium national income. That is, if you work that through, 2.5 times 75 gives us 187.50. And again, that is a stable relationship that would hold that if our slope, if our marginal offense to spend is changed, staying the same, then our multiplier is staying the same. If the only thing changing is our autonomous expenditure, well then, that change in autonomous multiplied by our multiplier will give us our change in output. And why is it giving us this change in output? Well, because this extra $75 that we decided to spend multiplied through our circular flow diagram 2.5 times, right? That's how many times it worked its way around before it petered out to essentially nothing. Okay, that does us for this video. Again, I apologize, it was a longer one. Important one though, the rest of the semester is built up from this video. Take your time going through this. There will be another video that's posted that's just examples of this Keynesian cross, of working through it. Keep in mind, there's still another video for this week that is building off of this Keynesian cross into our aggregate demand, aggregate supply. Don't worry, the next video building up into our aggregate demand, aggregate supply is not nearly as mathematical. It just builds off of these concepts and then utilizes these concepts in order to overcome that kind of basic assumption of, hey, we have a fixed price level. So we'll leave that for now. If you have any questions on anything we've worked through, please feel free to reach out to me, email, post below, or of course, please post on the frequently asked questions on the D2L site. Thanks, until next time.